Today's scripture is from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus has answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love thy neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So, um, our church's mission statement is, is printed in the bulletin every week. It's this one up here at the top. Uh, it's and it reads like this our mission is to love God love one another love those who don't know Jesus and introduce them to him that's a good mission statement uh, I think Glenn Shear came up with it a number of years ago at a board meeting and just to let you know Glenn Shear ripped it off the Bible he ripped off the Bible with this thing and that's cool because it's a good mission statement and he really ripped off the verses that we're looking at today in the text and uh, a mission statement's good. I mean, it's supposed to guide us in everything that we do. Um, it's supposed to guide us as we plan for the future, uh, how we spend our money, all those kinds of things. Uh, so it's a good mission statement, and it comes from the two things that Jesus says are the two greatest commandments anybody can know. So uh, whether we're following or not, that's another sermon that we can have some other time. But today I just want to look at the text. Another thing that's really important about what we read this morning is it's repeated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So anything that you find in the Bible that's repeated numerous times appears to be something that's worth knowing about because God's decided, I'm going to put this in three different books, therefore it should be important. And then it's not in the Gospel of John, but the Gospel of John is all about love anyway. The other thing about this, these texts is because we are a church that at least this year is following the lectionary, it is also included in all three cycles of the lectionary. So every year that a church is in the lectionary, it would deal with this text because it's that important. We come to the text this morning since chapter 10, which is where we were last week. Uh, we have jumped now late into chapter 12, and let me just kind of catch you up with what's occurred since the end of chapter 10. Jesus and his disciples have arrived in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus and his disciples have visited the temple. Uh, on another visit, Jesus cleans out the money changers and makes a proclamation in the temple. In another visit of the temple, Jesus is tested by the Pharisees and Sadducees and they continually ask him questions to try to catch him, to make a mistake. Uh, but, but then when we get to this point today, that all changes. There's no testing. There's no trying to catch Jesus in an error. There's a, a teacher of the law who, when he was there listening to Jesus answer these questions, just saw something different about Jesus. And you might argue that his heart was changed, there was something about Jesus that, that made him inquisitive. So when we come to verse 28, we hear one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate, and he realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? He realized that Jesus answered well. There was something about Jesus that caught him. This one teacher had 
heard something special in the way that Jesus answered the questions that encouraged him to step out of the pack and stop trying to test Jesus, but instead to just ask Jesus an honest question. And Mark, at least, this comes across as a personal question. Just between Jesus, between you and me, I'm a teacher of the law, just between the two of us, I have something I want to ask you about uh, that I'm confused about. And Jesus just responds plainly. He just gives them kind of a matter-of-fact response. And his question is no small question. We know that the teachers of the law had accumulated by this time in the history of Israel 613 rules of which to live by. 613. So we've gone from the Ten Commandments early in Exodus to 613 rules. Just try to figure that out uh, as you work your life. And of those, 365 were negative rules. Those are the thou shalt nots. Okay, so you got 365 of those. One, thou shalt not for every day of the year. And then the other 248 were positives. Thou shalt do this. So this is what's going on in this teacher of the law's head. And he's just saying, hey, Jesus, could you clear this up? I, I, this 613 rules is a lot of rules. We need some help here. So what would Jesus say? And this is what he says. The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. You must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Now, if you know your Bible or if you have a really good study Bible open in front of you, you're going to notice that Jesus didn't come up with this answer out of thin air. He's not making something up. Uh, what he's done is he's quoting two verses, or two lines, because there were no verses at this point in time in the, in the Bible, right? The Old Testament is just one document written, no verse bro broken up or anything, but two verses from two Old Testament books from the Pentateuch. The first one comes from Deuteronomy 6.4. Uh, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Notice there's no mind in that, so Jesus in this quote in Mark adds that. And then the second one comes from Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. What are Deuteronomy and Leviticus uh, when we look at the Bible? They are what is commonly referred to as the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, significant in the history of Judaism. It's the Torah. This is where a lot of, uh, anyway, these are important books in the development of the Old Testament. They tell of, of the development of Judaism. And in these, the law is given, and these are the ways that the Israelites were to live their lives uh, to mirror the God uh, that had saved them. Again, Jesus doesn't add anything new to this, but what he does add is uh, this guy asked him one question, and this is how Jesus works. He gave him more than he wanted because he's an abundant God. He gives him the first and the second, or the first most important that comes in two parts. If we look at the Ten Commandments for a minute, we can see that what Jesus tells this teacher of the law follows from what the Ten Commandments did. In the Ten Commandments, the first four are, do not have other gods before me, do not make an idol for yourself, do not misuse the name of God, and remember the Sabbath. These are God-centered commandments from the Ten Commandments. They are, for the most part, uh, they control one's relationship with God. These are God-centric. This is how you have a relationship with God. These are the patterns that I'm setting for you if you're going to have a healthy relationship with the covenant God of Israel. This is what you look for, these first four. But then we move to the next uh, grouping. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. 
don't steal, do not give false testimony, and do not covet. Now, I don't mean to say that these commands leave God out of the picture altogether, but it is clear that they mean to say something about personal relationships with people and how that uh, honors God, worships God, and loves God. It appears that what the Ten Commandments, and I think we miss it sometime, the Ten Commandments say you can't love God without loving the people who are around you. There's something about loving God that would have an effect on you, how you interact with the people around you. As individualists, uh, which Americans are strongly geared toward, we can live with controlling our relationship with God. In fact, most of us, for lack of a better term, we probably practice pretty much a private religion, private faith, as we walk this journey of faith. And we look at, you know, so we do private uh, meditation time. We read the Bible by ourselves. We pray alone with one another. This is all well and good, except there's the other part of it, too, which is, so how are you living with the people around you? How are you dealing with the people around you? Are you reading scripture with your community, the church? Are you, you know, how, how are these other people impacting or intertwined in your life? Seems to be a big thing in the Bible, especially with what Jesus said. So the questioner, he just eats up Jesus' answer. He loves it. He extols everything Jesus said. He said, well said, teacher. Awesome. You got it right, Jesus. You've spoken the truth by saying there's only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. And this is really key. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. You know, and today we hear that little verse there, and we, uh, yeah, I get that. You know, some of the stuff churches do, I don't understand it. all that ritual stuff. That's just not important. Why do you got to dress up for Sunday? I mean, we have lowered all kinds of things outside of John and Vera Louise here in tuxedos and stuff. I mean, you know, they just knew today was the day to dress up really well. You know, so we have this kind of relaxed. It really doesn't matter. Uh, how we comport ourselves or anything to God. So when we read this, yeah, you don't need these sacrifices and stuff. But here's the deal. In the day and time of Jesus, if you're going to worship God, where are you going to worship God? In the temple. And how are you going to worship God in the temple? You're going to sacrifice and you're going to give offerings. In fact, that's what set Judaism, the temple, and its rites apart from the rest of the people around them. That temple stuff gave them identity as the people of God. We are Abram's children. We are a nation created by God, and it's proven because we got the temple, and we go there. And in the temple is the Holy of Holies, and that's where God is, and we got God, and nobody else has him. So this guy just said, hey, love rules the day. I got to love God with everything I got. And all this human offering and uh, heart burnt offerings and sacrifices, this love is more important than that. That's, that's huge. Maybe he doesn't know what he just said. In the text, what Jesus has been telling people out throughout his journey to Jerusalem is he's saying... The temple's going to come down. It's going to be destroyed. And if a temple is destroyed, then that means there is an end to sacrifices and offerings. But Jesus said, I didn't come to get rid of prophecy. He says, I came to fulfill all the prophecies. And really what Jesus has been saying is, I am the new temple. I am the source of a new identity for, the, for Israel and for anybody else who wants to follow me. I am the center of all these things that used to be done in the temple. 
Now, I don't think this teacher of the law recognizes that, but that's what Jesus has been telling, that the new identity is going to be found in a relationship with me. But Jesus doesn't disparage this guy. He sees something in the response that's significant. So he says, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So I got to bring up a TV show, because you know me. Old TV show. Uh, this, the, it's about a, a super spy called Maxwell Smart. And one of his catchphrases, and he had a lot of them, was this one. Missed it by that much. Basically, Jesus is saying to this guy, Missed it by that much. How much? Well, maybe this is the teacher of the law, and maybe this is Jesus. Missed it by that much. Because he only sees Jesus as a good teacher. And it's kind of an echo chamber at this, because what this guy believes, Jesus just came back at him and told him everything he believes, and he's like, yeah, awesome! Except Jesus is telling him a little more than that. I remember when I was younger, early in my Christian life, like, you know, like two years ago, when I read this verse, I thought, I can love God that way. I can do it. He's telling me to do it. I can do it. I can love him with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. Oh my, my, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. No, I can't. Those of you who've been married for a long time, you, know, you don't have, I don't want you to turn to your spouse and answer this question. Have you loved your spouse in that way? With all your heart, mind, soul, Strength. Those of you who are you're in the career you love, have you loved your career with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Can I just be honest with you? I don't even love myself that way. I love myself, and there are days when I'm giving me everything I have, but even then it's not right. It, it, I, I'm failing even in loving myself, let alone loving my neighbor, let alone loving my God. Who's the person that you can point to who walked on this planet, who loved God with everything he or she had? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Only Jesus has been able to do that. And we fool ourselves when we hear and think, well, I'm going to do that. You know, this, is what I, this is what I do not want you to do this week. Grit your teeth and say, I'm going to love God with everything I have this week. Because it will probably be the most disastrous week you've ever had in your life. Instead, what I have to keep reminding myself is, missed it by that much, I'm looking at the person. I'm looking at Jesus. And he's the one who did it for me. And I have to allow him to live his life through me. And then my life will be better. Not perfect. You know. I love my wife, but I can't say that every day of my life I have loved her the way he's asking me to. I love some of my neighbors. Some of them I don't know, which tells you right away that I'm falling down on the job. I should know all of my neighbors, right? I should know every kid who lives in Ben's Hall at Loris College. They're my neighbors. I should be giving them breath mints on Friday and Saturday nights when they're coming back after the bars close. Hey, I love you, brother. Love you, sister. I don't do it. Jesus is the only person who listened to God, who responded to God, who healed for God, who touched people that no one else would touch, but he did it for God, who corrected people that 
People were afraid to correct, but he did it for God. He loved his neighbors. He loved the outcast. He loved the sick. He loved the injured. He loved the imperfect. He loved the blind. He even loved the people who put him on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And that love comes from the fact that he spent his whole life listening to his father saying, I love you so much. I will go wherever you want me to go. Oh, and he talked to his father and said, if you could let this pass, that would be really neat. But if not, I'm, gonna, I'm following you to the end. That's who Jesus is. If we think that we can do anything of merit without the intervention of God in our life, then we have basically said Jesus is irrelevant. We don't need him. We can accomplish all these things God says without really Jesus' intervention. If we think we can please God uh, in anything without living in this atoning, substitutionary life that we get from Jesus Christ, then we've denied our own failings and we've rejected the love of God that has been poured out to us through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus isn't just a great teacher. He's not just a wise teacher. Jesus is a great God. He is God, and he follows his Father to the cross itself for the glory of God, not for his glory, but for the glory of God. And he does it because of his all-consuming love for his Father, God. So the core value that we need to look at this morning is that you and I need Jesus. That, that's what really Christianity is about. You and I need Jesus. If we have any hope of doing something for God in this world, we must do it in the power and love of Jesus. We must allow the life and the power of Jesus to permeate who we are in these stone hearts of ours and to loosen it up and to crack it so that the heart and love of Jesus can flow through us, but we have to beseech God and ask Jesus to do something for us because we are really great at accomplishing some really cool things on our own. But those things aren't going to last. We have to seek the help of Jesus. So, if our walk of faith is not characterized by love, and some days it is, and some days it isn't, but here's the deal, you don't know which love you're serving, this is what we got to do. We, we got to pray to God and we got to ask God to help us love him. We got to pray to God, we got to ask God to help us love our neighbor. We got to pray to God and ask God to help us love Jesus. We have to pray to God and ask him to help us to love the Holy Spirit and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have to pray to God and ask to be able to live in God's power and might and glory and justice and love and grace. If we're going to accomplish great things for the kingdom, we have to always be in prayer. Pray 24 hours. Pray all things. Pray all the time to Jesus to seek him out and to live in his power so that we can have see something occur on this planet called the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's pray a minute here. Forgive me, and I'm just going to bring people into this circle. Lord, we are such accomplished folks. We're so many things we're really good at. And you've gifted us with these abilities. You implanted them in our genes at an early age. You gave us an ability to learn and our crafts and, and get better. But even at that, even at our best, even at what we can accomplish, Lord, we still need you to intervene in our lives, to take this ability to serve you, to love you, and to love others. We need your help to do that. Elsewhere in scriptures it says that what does it cost us to love folks who respond in kindness to us? It's really, how do you love your enemies? How do you love the people that you disagree with, the people who see the world differently from us? Lord, you've asked us to love those neighbors as well. So we need your divine intervention. We need your power 
and peace that surpasses understanding. We need you to be the people you want us to be. And Jesus is our answer. We want more of Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And we all say amen. Amen. Thank you.